the worst time to start a panel because you're already late and people are looking at the watch for lunch. But bear with us. We'll try to keep it short and uh, try to make it as interactive as possible. See, the topic we're trying to discuss around is the large scale assessments. Just to give certain idea around assessments has been always in education a point of debate, right? Is it for measuring? Is it for diagnostic? Does it represent something? Do across spectrum assessments make sense, not sense? I mean, all those questions around assessments always stay, put, right? Uh, we'll try to explore some of those aspects in this panel. But before that, we will introduce uh, each one of us and what is their point of view around assessments and what work they are trying to do. Thank you very much, uh, Biaz. First of all, this is not the worst session because the worst session is after lunch because after the, most of the time people go to sleep uh, after eating. Uh, that's number one. Number two is that uh, by way of introduction, my name is uh, Pradeep Khanna. I live in Sydney in Australia. Uh, I have been living there for 28 years. We are very strongly focused on how technology and globalization are reshaping the way we live, learn and work. I'm also very deeply immersed into virtual reality and augmented reality. I am the Asia Pacific Director for the VR AR Association. I am the Sydney President as well as the Global Co-Chair Education. I am on a global IEEE panel where there are people from Harvard, MIT, Facebook, HP, etc. where we are setting standards in VR AR. I am also setting up a marketplace in virtual reality and augmented reality. And my perspective insofar as assessments are concerned are that we are going to see VR, AR reach a tipping point in the next two to three years and we are going to see disruption in assessments through VR and AR. I'll stop at this for the time being and pass it over to the next person please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Arjit Ghosh. Uh, I represent an organization, Education Quality Foundation of India. It's a not-for-profit uh, NGO. We work uh, primarily in five core strands, large-scale student learning outcome assessments. We do impact assessment of programs. We also do audits of teaching learning processes, including uh, audits of teachers' pedagogical skills. We do content development uh, and teacher training, and we also implement programs on the ground. Uh, my take on assessments, uh, I'll just take a step back and uh, reflect on the actual uh, and important difference between the terms assessment and testing. Sometimes we get into a particular zone where we think that assessments is all about testing. At certain periods of time, you uh, ask a child to take a test and then get the results, do a diagnostic and give a report. So for me, assessments has to be as a process, not a product, point number one. Point number two is it should equip the teacher at every point of time to take those data-informed decisions and interventions. So these are the two major points for me in terms of assessments, more of continuous. Over to Srini. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I represent Educational Initiatives, uh, which has been in the field of assessments and uh, adaptive learning since 2001. Uh, and uh, my, our take on assessment is uh, one, it needs to be focused towards helping children understand the concept, the underlying concept of what they are reading. That's what is extremely critical. And also, at the same time, diagnose exactly what the child has understood and what the child has not understood. And that pertains to uh, you know, uh, formative or summative assessments as also topic-based uh, assessments when it comes to individual topics. Uh, and as far as the learning is concerned, uh, assessment again plays a very key role uh, in uh, learning programs, wherein at the appropriate time, in the learning's path of the child, we are able to 
induce questions that will then tell us exactly where the level of understanding of the child is and thereby address the misconception that the child may have. Uh, the other part also is uh, to what you mentioned, sir, about um, uh, you know equipping teachers, equipping faculty with uh, the right amount of data that then enables them to address individual uh, students uh, in terms of helping them learn what they are reading conceptually. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Saumya. I'm uh, here on behalf of Gray Matters India. Uh, Gray Matters India is also an education assessment and analytics company. Uh, we've done a large body of work with affordable private schools, government schools, as well as high-end high -end private schools, um, doing standardized assessments and, uh, of course, looking at the data from um, both the points that uh, all the panelists mentioned here about where is the child on a learning continuum and uh, should he be there now that is more of our uh, focus about where are the standards right uh, just to take you all to another place i know you've all been hearing about education for too long for two days um, i come from another place i came from healthcare and uh, the diagnostic industry revolutionized healthcare in the past couple of decades right and uh, the diagnostic industry was able to do that because we had standards, right? You know in 80-20 is the range for uh, good blood pressure or, or the right sugar levels, right? Now, I think education, while by syllabus, is de determining uh, what a standard is. So this is what a grade 3 child should be learning. Uh, are those the real academic standards? Are those universal? And I think that comes a lot from data. And I think that is also one of the things that we are looking at so what are the standards against which we should measure and how do we say whether a system a school or a child is moving in the direction that it's supposed to move and is it moving enough right i think um, just having uh, agreeing to all of what they said so measuring is important and measurement should be actionable otherwise there's no point measuring and to make it actionable you need the standards that you compare against so all of those are our perspectives on assessments Hi, thanks everyone uh, see my first question to the panel is especially to mr khanna's viewers see how do you see the future of assessments you talked of new technologies what is your view on it with the assessment the way we know it will change how it will change uh, thanks, Beers. I speak at conferences all over the world. And when I speak on emerging technologies and virtual reality and augmented reality, I will not tell you what percentage of people don't know the difference between VR and AR. Let me ask the audience at this particular stage, how many people in the audience know the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality? One, two, three, four. And we've got approximately 50 people. That is about 8% of the people. Well, see that my average is 70% of the people don't know the difference between VR and AR, despite the technology being around for the last 20 years. But what we are seeing is, we are seeing the tipping point coming in the next two to three years. So what does it mean for assessment? Let me give you another example and let me kind of walk you through what, what we are in AR in a two minute kind of a span. Here we are real people sitting over here. This is a real table, real people over, this is the real world. Let's say we want to go and land on the moon. Can we do that? No, unless we are Elon Musk. Now, when we create a virtual experience of landing on the moon, that is virtual reality. Now the spectrum as you go from the real world to the virtual world is called mixed reality. There are various stages in between. The first stage is called augmented reality when you augment digital objects to the real world. Just give you an example, there is an IKEA which is open in Hyderabad. If you go to IKEA, you want to buy a table like this and you know, uh, you want to decide whether I want to go for a round table or a square table, you can actually get a digital object of the table into the photo shoot of your room and decide which color you want or not. That is augmented reality. Then you've got another stage which is called augmented virtuality. Now, this is just to give you a top level view of what is the difference between AR and VR. Now, let's look at what happens in the case of assessments. 
assessments is in a way going through a process i don't want to go into discussions of you know formative or uh, subject or oh, yeah, there are so many different variations of that but really what we are trying to do is we are having different scenarios where we are looking at how the person is responding just imagine if you create those scenarios in a virtual world that is where we are heading towards there are companies already established at the moment who are carrying out assessments in vr so what you are doing is let's say if in you know, a right from vocational skills to 21st century skills to coaching skills to any damn thing you can i was speaking at a conference in in new delhi the other day um when uh, uh, the education secretary from telangana was in the audience he came to me after the uh, after my talk and he said that i want to know more about vr ar because i don't have money to build up labs for my school so you just look at that you know you can create an environment you can create scenarios and you can get people to respond to those various scenarios this tons and tons so that's where it is heading but it is not there at the moment it is going to be we are looking at about 5 years because we are looking at about 2 two, two and a half years 3 years for vr ar to start having a tipping point it is already having a very big impact in education and training and you see uh, assessments coming through in about 4 to 5 years thanks i mean what i'm gathering from that is that typically a lot of assessments seems to be theoretical in nature or can't mimic a lot of real time environment i think in the future we'll probably be able to have assessments where we can have lot more immersive real time environment where the children can be expected to do see as a veteran of doing assessments i think education initiatives have done a lot of work can you can you share thoughts on what has been the large scale assessment things in india in the sense what are the challenges to conduct those what are the results of done that and how is that different from the private school assessment you conduct sure thank you um, <clears throat> so in in the large scale especially pertaining to uh, uh, you know the weaker sections of society and in the government typically how assessments has been done is that you administer tests uh, as you put it to um, a large group of students and then you get an expert moderator or an expert uh, academician to mark those tests and it kind of stops there because it's almost impossible to disseminate relevant information based on those tests or assessments whatever you may call them to the uh, students so that is how it has typically been done traditionally uh, what um, <clears throat> the way edtech is revolutionizing this is that <clears throat> we are now able to actually help the child go through the learning path and then feed in relevant uh, assessments at appropriate time that is where you know we are able to um, not just customize it to the child so that we can give relevant feedback to the child but also get benchmarking data based on where these children are from a conceptual understanding perspective so you will have a child in rajasthan near bikaner and you will have a child in uh, tamil nadu near uh, uti and these children are learning in different languages they are learning in different medium and they are following different textbooks also but they are fundamentally learning the same concept so with what we are doing in terms of large scale assessments you can find out whether this child sitting in rajasthan and the other sitting in remote tamil nadu are learning the concept and how do they benchmark amongst each other that is the uh, basic difference between how it used to get done in the earlier days versus now in fact that what leads to my next question is so may you talk to us about the standards we all know there is no one india right there are many indias in india so how how do you standardize or come up with the standards in a complex country like india or and this yeah um i just before i answer that question i just wanted to add to shrini's point about um the one is the digital and the technical technology piece of it but also i think when we disseminate results and i think all three of us have been in this uh, business know that uh, who uses these reports who cares about these reports i think it's on the news for a while and then it goes away uh, i think one of the trends we are seeing and we seeing as the future of assessments and also education reformation in the country is a uh, impact based incentivization right so there is the development impact bond which has come into india which kind of uh, 
pays out based on a certain impact that you achieve. Uh, and I want to give the example of Saksham Haryana, which has been a phenomenal program. It's the first time a state government has conducted an assessment. And there is percolation right all the way down to the teacher level in terms of understanding skills that we are testing, right? You know what, the only thing, different thing that they did to the usual NAS and uh, assers of the world, it wasn't a top-down approach. They said, as blocks, you nominate yourself if you think you're confident that you're grade level. The blocks got into a competition mode, and today, and I think it's actually for the first time ever, it's going to be an election conversation this time in Haryana, right? So I think that is also another future. The digital piece is important to make that future possible, but that's an enabler. But the future of assessments has to be that tool that unlocks impact, right? And that segues into the standards conversation where if I don't have the standards, like in DIB, this was one of the biggest conversations we had, key, how are you setting targets? What is, what is the target, right? And we have, we've had to defend, and especially with the interventions who are on the ground to be very fair to them, right? I think they are doing a lot of hard work and you're coming and judging them. And they're like, how can you say that's what it is? And that's data is the key to that. The more and more data we build, like we've uh, done about a million tests now, uh, and we have data on different types of interventions, different types of schools, like you said, um, OT or Bikaner, or uh, you know, English medium, 100 rupee school, uh, one lakh international school, or a government rural school, tribal school. In Kashmir, in Tamil Nadu, in West Bengal, we have you kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a fully complete data, but if you keep building on that data to arrive at the standards, because if you can't arrive at the standards, it's without building on the data. And that, that dip conversation is a kind of actual example of how standards were set. We said, hey, we've assessed so many interventions that have done remedial programs. This is the impact they've been able to achieve. So therefore, we're expecting you to achieve a stretch of this or you know, whatever the conversations and negotiations are. But um, yeah, that's the answer to your standards question is just more data, basically. Can I add one more yeah. uh, point to this? This is very interesting. So in addition to impact, um, you know, assessments or testing per se uh, gives rise to a feeling of uh, antagonism in most children you know so there is a little bit of fear there is a little bit of aversion and that causes forgetting what the child learned anyway so a majority of the children don't uh, quote unquote perform well in assessments because of the fear of assessments or the fear of testing and how is it that we can uh, make assessments not cause this uh, sense of fear among children. That's another very critical uh, thing that we need to consider in the future. The other point that I, I wanted to touch upon is you talked about private, the difference between uh, you know the uh, 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 underprivileged sections of society or underserved sections of society versus private schools. In private schools, it is more about preparing for the future from grade five or six onwards. Uh, it's only up to grade four or five where you are focused on learning the topic. After that, it's actually what am I going to do? Am I going to be in which stream? And am I going to go to which school or which college after after I finish my 11th or 12th grade, right? Whereas in, uh, in the rural areas, it is more about actually learning uh, even after you have crossed grade eight, you know, because most of the children have actually not even learned till then. So even there, the focus is uh, on actually learning the topic. So though that's a, the, and assessment need to be different from both these uh, uh, segments. Just add one uh, point, Bias here. In fact, I was just going to comment on the stress level and um, adding a few interesting uh, data to it. The PISA 2015 uh, assessments um, had uh, one element of uh, socio-emotional well-being of the children. And data from there, it says that 66% of the children in uh, countries across the world, uh, in 92 countries across the world, feel uh, stressed while there is an exam around the corner. And 55% of the kids feel anxious even if they are well prepared for the test. So the entire mechanism of test itself is very overwhelming for a child. So I think when we are talking and largely more and more emphasis is being on the social and emotional well-being of the child, I think we need to uh, look beyond 
assessments and only students as the target audience. So there has to be, again, uh, what I said earlier, the entire, it should be a process which both Swami and Srini did uh, touch upon as well, which would allow the teachers to understand the learning levels of the child and take appropriate interventions at the required levels. So when that happens, then assessment becomes an enabler and not a deterrent. So currently what is happening is it becomes very uncomfortable for the child when you go and tell them that, come on, you have to sit for this particular assessment or testing, which actually it means. So I think this, and I strongly advocate that a future of uh, assessments is the power of more and more ingrained analytics. And I think big data has a huge role to play in the education industry, which can add really qualitative, uh, quantifiable qualitative parameters into the assessment space, which can then help both the teachers as well as the policy makers for making those large, important, impactful decisions. Uh, Vyas, with your permission, I would like to make a comment as well as ask a question. See, the discussion has already gone around from standards to assessment for the sake of assessment and assessment for learning. Now, we are into a world where adaptive assessments are, are, are a reality at the moment. You know? We are into the world where Professor Eric Mazou from Harvard, you know, a strong proponent of peer assessments is already kind of emerging into full-blown uh, reality. You know? So I want to ask my co-panelists, what are their thoughts on that? What are the thoughts on adaptive assessment? What are the thoughts on uh, 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 peer assessments? And I also want to make a comment, and the comment was really around, this is where when we are talking about engagement, we are talking about learning, that's where the immersive technologies come into play because they are the ones which are most engaging from a learner's perspective. So over to both, all three of you for your comments on peer assessment as well as on uh, adaptive assessment. Um. Interesting, very, very, very important point over here. Now, I would just like to, I'm not advocating, but I'd just like to comment on uh, Khan Academy. Khan Academy has been a wonderful um, platform for the adaptive assessment scenario and basically mastery of one's skills. So you are actually competing with your own self. But um, the, the concept is fabulous. I have no problem with the model of Khan Academy. But if you are looking into the Indian landscape, the diversity, Khan Academy works best and also global research has said that technology works best when it is completely engaging to the child. Also Khan Academy wants a one is to one device. Now when uh, more than 65% of the enrollment is in the rural sector, where still internet is a challenge, the basic technology, forget technology infrastructure, basic infrastructure is a challenge. There the adaptive part, I think concept wise fabulous, globally fantastic work is happening. But I personally feel in India, it has still a few more years uh, till we reap that entire benefit of uh, that particular concept. So that's my take on adaptive. Actually, I kind of disagree with you because uh, uh, since 2006, uh, we have uh, a product that is called MindSpark, which is a learning solution. And MindSpark uses adaptive assessments to help children learn. And uh, there are currently about 150,000 children that take MindSpark annually, every year. And it actually works on scalably, one of the core aspects of the core engines that drive MindSpark is uh, scalably difficult questions that get asked up to a point where the child is not able to answer. It's like building a muscle in the gym. You know, you keep exercising your muscle up to a point where the tissue breaks. And when the tissue then reconstructs itself, it is much stronger than it used to be. Similarly, my, the adaptive logic and adaptive assessment of MindSpark takes it to a break point where the child is not able to answer and then reconstructs, uh, gives uh, scaffoldings and brings back the child at a higher level than the child was uh, previously. So, and it's been working since 2006 uh, and doing well. Uh.
no apologies. I really forgot about MindSpark, but MindSpark has been a really uh, one of the real, real exceptions. Thank you for picking that up. One of the reasons large-scale assessments are conducted are done is pretty much to dictate the macro policies of our state. Assessments as an individual assessment at personalized level is a different debate altogether, and the technology to conduct can be another topic of discussion. For example, I'll share one example. The large-scale assessments when Mexico decided that they're going to be a tourist-based economy, and certain segment of it they're going to de develop. They conducted the assessments around the soft skills of their students and then tried to use that as a policy measure to make sure that the students who come out of the 12th grade standard have a much higher levels towards hospitality, towards curtness, because that's going to help them develop the tourism industry, which was further again replicated by another one country, very successfully Indians know that more is Thailand. So I wanted to ask you panelists, is there any example in any of the states you guys have worked in a large scale assessment which has been done with targeting fundamentally some macro policy inter towards education or something? If you can share any more. Um, I just give examples from our work that have allowed that to happen. Um, I'm sure all of you can add. Uh, so I think one of the things uh, that we have been kind of uh, working on is a public-private partnership in government schools, and we had published a research uh, in partnership with the Education Alliance about three, four years ago. And I think the Delhi government has made a move to bring in public-private partnerships into their schools. They've given a pilot phase now, and then on further study, they're planning to scale it. So that's like a big push. And that of obviously, everything is based on data that these schools actually show better learning outcomes as opposed to um, not having a private partner working in the school. right? And the other case is, like I already mentioned, the Saksham Haryana piece, where uh, they are, once a block is declared as Saksham, so essentially, we're saying 80% of your students are grade level. That means that block. Uh, is declared as suction. And once they are declared as suction, then the government brings in further uh, interventions. They get some English medium interventions, some digital interventions. So I, it's, I wouldn't still call it a policy change, but something that the, 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 the report and the larger assessment drives towards. And these, I think, would be two big uh, examples of the work that we've done, which kind of have driven or changed policy. Yeah. Um, no, our focus has primarily been on uh, language and uh, arithmetic. You know, and, uh, uh, that's that's where we our focus is, and uh, we uh, believe that those are the two skills that will be relevant in whichever world we live in, uh, and that's that's what is uh, uh, important for children of the future. And also, you know, in the morning, I was talking about um, foundational skills, and we'll be surprised to know that children, more than 50% of the children, get out of school without picking up foundational skills. And the only way that we can uh, get uh, them to uh, understand basic foundational core skills are through focusing on uh, language and arithmetic. That's what we do. We don't go beyond that. Yeah. So, Sujay, you go and ask for grant, typically to conduct a large-scale assessments, et cetera. Can you share what are the major motives of people who try to conduct the assessments at a scale, who commission you the projects to conduct large-scale assessments? For you. Um, so this, when we, um, what, what, how we operate is through uh, request for proposals and grant calls primary from uh, funders who have been uh, implementing a program on the ground to see that whether the program which was operational on the ground has actually made that particular impact. So uh, the answer to uh, the question, uh, Bias, is it's, it's, it, there's no simple single answer to this because this depends on the project itself. So what was the outcome? Uh, of the project, the desired project, what were the desired outcomes. And then we design assessments on the basis of that outcome. I'll give an example. Uh, Srini talked about uh, foundation skills. In some of the projects where we have worked, the implementing body, uh, their major work was focused on building basic numeracy and literacy skills. 
so obviously the assessment tools that were designed were to check whether those basic foundation skills have improved or not in some other project uh, their focus was primarily that whether the uh, design thinking skills have improved or not so accordingly the tools were different currently we are about to start a project with uh, delhi municipality schools where they also want apart from student learning and impact they also want whether the teachers delivery or the teachers pedagogy how impactful it is in the classroom because we are only otherwise testing student performance but day to day operations what is the role of the teacher so again over there the assessment tools are totally different so we have a framework on teacher skills where we focus on five areas uh, learner management resource management transaction of learning materials 21st century skills and professional culture because primarily in the government sector uh, one major uh, problem which many talk us about is the lack of motivation on the part of these teachers but my personal experience has been in certain pockets uh it's completely different lowest paid teachers fantastic very high motivation and i'm i would like to make a comment over here particularly of the teachers from the kasturba gandhi balika vidyalayas so kgbb teachers are one of the highest motivated teachers which i have observed in my little experience so in short there's no single answer to that uh, according to my uh, take on it so bias uh I just want to respond to the earlier question which was in regard to examples of policy driven assessments and I want to give an example of uh, Australia where we have um, ACARA a body by the name which is called for Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Agency it is a body which is owned by the federal government the equivalent of central government in India and it works with all the state governments because the education is a state subject they carry out regular assessments you know uh for schools across and these are assessments in you know basic literacy numeracy um kind of this thing they have now been moving on to from paper based to online to a national adaptive assessment process this is just one example of how it is happening in australia okay. now i think thanks everyone for the views look just to summarize what we have talked about you asked for the questions is large scale assessments are very very critical aspect of any society at a policy maker decision level they need to be conducted to really really dictate lot of education policy matter i think uh, new technologies are giving lot of new opportunities in terms of being able to conduct them more effectively and that's where the business opportunities for the people in the audience lies there are, whether we can conduct them through ai vr whether we can conduct them through adaptive through electronic formats trying to use them across to compare across the countries you know across the subject on a global level i think that's where the future of those large scale assessments is headed towards and i think personalization will take away a lot of unnecessary debate which used to happen through large scale assessments in terms of saying that you know it is not applicable to me or it's not applicable in this condition i think adding the touch of adaptive to it will remove some of those things with that we will try to open the, for the questions anybody has a question will like to answer so my question is that uh, when you talk about large scale assessment uh, there is always a you know kind of uh, so let's say performance based assessment or task based assessment uh, there is a problem that if we want to scale them somehow you know we also have in mind that you know we don't want to dilute the quality of you know the answers or the assessments going in so how do you scale keeping that in mind that you know uh, the quality should not be diluted the quality is uniformly applied across the uh like when you when you i am assuming you're talking about how to do it in volume right because the assessment quality itself is not related to how many students you're testing it's going to be based on the standards we're testing against but the quality issue actually comes and we have a lot of experience doing these um a lot of these assessments on the ground and of course uh we 
with the high stakes attached to it, a lot of things happen uh, on the ground. But uh, we believe that the data we collect has to be, if you're making policy decisions, we are driving um, a certain macro change based on that data, it better be good quality data. So one of the things uh, we have done, uh, not, uh, just I'll talk just about the technology pieces that we've done. Of course, we have this very unscalable model as, as of now, which way we have people going on the ground and conducting these assessments, but also, Two things that we do, which is one is on the field, which we, we've not yet done, but we're going to do, is we do have an app that works offline that we take to the schools and conduct the assessments in, trying to bring in like a camera ability into that, which says, and currently anyway, the child can't escape the app during the assessment, but also bringing in a camera ability so that there's no teacher intervention. But when we do really large scale and we're not doing uh, tabs, we do a retrospective analysis. We run an algor algorithm on pattern checks which tells us whether, uh, you know, we expect a certain pattern in the responses when based on the difficulty of the questions and that comes from the dis test instrument design. Uh, and that's actually in Haryana we've used that we've actually disqualified blocks uh, when we found the data, of, the quality of data was poor. Uh, that's how technology comes in and we scale uh, without have to worrying about the quality of data getting diluted. Answered your question. Next person, maybe. Capacities or something like that. They should be on multiple. Mm -hmm. I wonder, do you have something like giving an open book to a student and then come up with some sort of things? Yeah. Okay, so learning should be some sort of fun than that of what you call as a lot of stress. I think a sir was talking about a lot of stress and the figures were given actually. Mm -hmm. So, do you have in your platform all these parameters are in sync, uh, which will focus? the intellectual, emotional, all needs, you know, like, it's a multi-segmented uh, uh, platform. Do you have that or it's just like what we see in campus recruitment kind of stuff, you know, like? I have a very long uh, maybe science abilities uh, because I think um, as a focus area, we've chosen that the system is so broken that the if as an education, and again, I'm talking about large-scale assessment. We're not talking about individual assessments, right? So. If we, we, if we don't fix this, then, uh, then we are not doing justice to the child. This is the bare minimum that the system has to deliver to a child, right? That said, uh, we do have a retail program where we talk, we do directly program with students, which is called the All India Critical Thinking Test. It's done on, uh, like I mentioned, on tabs. It's a fun test. It's where children interact on the tab. It has patterns. It has, doesn't have questions from the school. Uh, school. It's, it's more of puzzles type of a thing, which we do. Uh, and going on that spectrum to, OK, you're talking about uh, subject specifically. You're talking about overall IQ. And you want to talk about social, emotional well-being. And this gets. Uh, I've had enough panels where we've talked about, oh, we should measure social emotional well-being, and we've done that also. Um, it's, it's a very tricky area because the standards which I started off with are so diverse and vary so much. What is a standard to say a child should be introverted or extroverted? If they are extroverted, should we make them introverted? Right? So I think the standards and what do you measure against, I mean, and not to say this will never be done, it's very evolving, and to do something standardized again on a large scale is very, very uh, challenging at this point of time. Definitely there'll be movement. Uh, but when just keeping to the panel on the topic of the panel, which is large scale assessments, I think right now the need is to measure the learning outcomes, and I'll let the rest of the panel add in if required. Seeing on MCQs, where it's um, it could be heuristic based also. Yes, there are algorithms to tackle, but what happens to short answers, descriptive answers, writing skills of a student? Actually, that's a great point, and um, uh, so yeah, part of uh, our assessments now, the new work that we are doing includes reading assessments and also essay writing, assessing the essay writing uh, paragraphs, and so on and so forth. So, uh, absolutely agree with you that those are critical elements too, and need to be uh, addressed. Um, as of now, or as on date, is there any solution for writing? Reading, yes, it's tackled when you read. An MCQ, you have to read, understand only then comprehend to answer it. How about writing? Anything already in um, is functional as on date? Uh, 
so as part of our mind spark program there is uh, writing um, uh, you know where you are expected to write paragraphs or essays and there is assessment uh, on those two so, so it's yes, manually done is there a tool to no, evaluate? No, it's yeah, yeah. It's not manually done. It's algorithmic. It's uh, and driven and through the tablets. Okay. So AI enabled there. Uh, I wouldn't call it AI. It's adaptive. Um, it's not yet AI. It's more adaptive. But yeah, in future possibly there'll be some AI element coming into it. More from a predictive analytics perspective uh, rather than actual core content of the uh, writing uh, para itself, written para itself. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. We are running out of time. Just to add to the point, when you asked of the English one, the basic theory around that is called TRT, which is done the information one. So that is getting implemented. If you use next product, you will have that. Uh, so, but uh, about writing, I think writing is a much, much tougher problem. I think Grammarly is a step forward towards that. But I think we are like at least four or five years away from doing the writing assessment effectively because you want to measure whether the child wrote first time, second time. I think that's still a slightly unsolved problem. But the reading one through MCQ, knowledge-based, is solved through TRT. OK, now thanks. The gentleman also asked the last question. I'm already two minutes late. You can ask it, please, any one of us catch later. When I interact with students, the biggest problem I find is with MCQs. So many students in our country able to answer how many times our prime minister visited USA. But when I ask a question, what is the significance of the visit? Very few, less than 1% of Indians can answer. What is your solution for this? You are mostly concentrating on assessment through MCQs. My request and my suggestion is, please go beyond that. Please concentrate on analysis critical thinking, inquisitive thinking. Please develop the tools to raise the education system to such standard. It is from my core of the heart. Thank you. Thanks. So it doesn't mean they don't test critical thinking. They are designed in a way to test critical thinking. Uh, I'm sure we all have some items, some of our questions on our websites, and you can go look at them. They are not rote learning. They're not memory based. In fact, MCQs, at least in schools and the schools that we work in, is pushing towards critical thinking and not like the school tests that we do. And I, I really, really strongly feel the type of question it does not decide how the child, uh, the thinking skill that is being tested. Yeah. MCQ in fact, in tool, fact right? um, I didn't want to repeat myself, but uh, uh, she's absolutely right. And some of the problems that you are facing, sir, are probably because of the foundational skills not having been addressed. It's more related to that rather than to what type of uh, assessment that they have gone through. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Ah, I think it was great discussion. Good questions. Have lunch and. We will not keep you waiting. Thanks.